Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Health Association's annual Earth Day webinar. This year's Earth Day theme is investing in our planet, and today's presenters will share why investing in the environment is investing in health and in our mission as a ministry of the Catholic Church. They will share examples of programs that address healthcare's adverse impacts and on the environment with a special focus on sustainable food programs. My name is Indu Spagnardi, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Resource Development here at CHA, and I'll be the moderator for today's program. But before I begin, and before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to open with a video reflection, which features the prayer from Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. So please take a moment to center yourselves and reflect on his words. beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. I, I apologize for the glitch. I think you might have heard the last part of the prayer, but I did put a link to it. It's lovely. So if you, you have a chance to listen to it at a later uh, time, please do so. Now, I'd like to um, take this time to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Laura Andurko, who's co-director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment at Villanova University M. Louise Fitzpatrick College of Nursing. She's an educator uh, and scholar in public health, nursing, and environmental health. And John Stoddard, he is Associate Director of Climate and Food Strategy for Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Food in Healthcare Program. And his work focuses on engaging health systems um, and healthcare organizations to build um, food systems that are equitable and health promoting. So as a reminder, if you have questions for the presenters at any time, please enter them in the Q&A module. And now I'd love to turn it over to Laura to begin the discussion. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Indu. Welcome everyone. So um, I'm going to be discussing um, uh, how our lives are connected to nature, how health is impacted by the environment, and um, how Laudato Si um, provides us some guidance and a framework. Uh, before I do that, I just want to give you a quick um, introduction to the work that I do at the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. We are one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units across the country uh, working on um, improving reproductive and children's health with a focus on um, environmental racism and the threat of climate change. Uh, we are located in the yellow portion of the map. Um, there is a PESU wherever you live in the United States. Uh, take a look and if you have uh, questions about environmental exposures and health, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are funded through uh, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, that's the National Program Office, primarily funding through the CDC's ATSDR and some support from EPA. 
So uh, in celebration of Earth Day, um, I love this time of year. It's a time of growth and hope. Uh, this photograph comes from the National Archives on the very first Earth Day. Um, wouldn't it be grand if we had all of these people celebrating Earth Day in the streets um, uh, each and every year? Um, it's from 1970. And um, as I uh, briefly mentioned, um, today I'm going to talk about the connection between health and the environment, the types of investments healthcare organizations can make to protect and heal the environment, and how the concepts of Laudato C can inspire, guide, and inform those investments. This is another picture um, right before EPA um, was launched. This is from 1972. Uh, and when we talk about the environment and being outside, most of us think about green space and clean air, but this clearly shows uh, air pollution and um, places that may not be very healthy. Um, Indu uh, authored an article in Health Progress in winter of 2022, um, Tools to Overcome Environmental Justice. And um, one of the things that chock full of interesting data and suggestions um, for all of us in healthcare to think about when we address environmental injustices, but that African-Americans face a 54% higher health burden from air pollution, uh, such as particulate matter compared to the overall population. And that communities of color have a 28% higher health burden compared to overall populations. So I'd like us to keep that in mind as we're looking about at um, healthcare organizations and solutions and thinking about those communities that bear um, an undue burden of the pollution. Uh, this, this photograph, of course, is lovely and where we'd all like to be on this uh, wonderful afternoon in DC at least. And um, we know that being in nature improves our mental health and actually decreases several risk factors related to mental health illness. Uh, we also know that um, it improves our physical health. Um, we also know that these spaces are declining in number and that many communities um, do not um, have the access or the availability of these green spaces. Um, literature continues to emerge that shows that the health of the ecosystem cannot be um, separated from animal, uh, uh, from the health of all humans, including animals, plants, and the environments that we live in. We are connected. And this is a message that uh, the Pope states very clearly in uh, Laudato Si. Um, when we talk about the environment, oftentimes um, I'm a nurse in health and healthcare. We think about space, we think about houses, we think about schools and where we work, but it's really defined as everything that surrounds us. And it also isn't just about humans. It's about the spaces that plants and animals um, um, live with us. And um, that many of the choices we make oftentimes that lead to pollution are also impacting the health of other living things. Um, this is a great definition um, that I find nails it on the head a lot better than some of the other definitions I've seen over the years. Um, what is environmental health? Um, many of us in health uh, that are health professionals have not had a course or a lecture in, in environmental health or how environment impacts us as humans but it's, uh, it was defined in the IOM report back in 95 as a freedom from illness or injury related to exposure to toxic agents and other environmental conditions that are potentially detrimental to human health. Um, and that includes the climate changes that we're seeing uh, here on earth. Uh, this is a photograph again, just as the EPA was launching uh, from 1972, it's a, a Tacoma smelter uh, located right by a home uh, that is emit emitting arsenic and lead. Unfortunately, this practice continues as we're looking at fracking wells. Uh, many California homes uh, in certain parts of the state have fracking wells right next door to their home. So um, 
Pope Francis talks about nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. We are part of nature included in it and thus in constant interaction with it. And this, uh, this diagram actually comes from some work from Aldo Leopold, who had similar writings about us being connected. And um, we currently are much more on the left side of the diagram, which is the ego rather than the eco, where we live in harmony and um, each creature is, is equal in its, its need for a healthy environment. Uh, right now, we're much more about controlling the environment and um, other living things. So as we talk about healthcare organizations, how they invest to protect and heal the environment, um, I'd like to point out uh, a report called Climate Smart Healthcare put out by World Bank Group in partnership with Healthcare Without Harm. Um, it's an excellent um, uh, report on various things that are occurring across the world, um, even in countries with less resources in the U.S., and how they're making a more positive impact for sustainability in their healthcare operations um, with the key goal in protecting the planet. Another part of Laudato Si, Pope Francis talks about the urgent need to develop policies so that in the next few years, the emission of carbon dioxide and other highly polluting gases can be drastically reduced. For example, substituting for fossil fuels and developing sources of renewable energy. And some of the case studies that you'll see in um, uh, not only climate uh, smart healthcare, but some of the documents that Catholic Health Association puts out really underscores how many healthcare organizations are looking at just that, looking at developing sources of renewable energy. Now there's a group called Global Green and Healthy Hospitals. Um, I believe the website is greenhospitals.org and they have an agenda for sustainability. And again, this is a worldwide organization um, that talks about some of the key pieces that healthcare organizations should think about um, as they want to move towards being um, sustainable. The first, of course, is leadership, so that the leadership prioritizes environmental health. Um, the next is to think about chemicals and how one might uh, one organization might substitute harmful chemicals with safer alternatives. The EPA has something called Safer Choice Program, and you can look up um, uh, maybe a cleaning product and see what what's in that product and they will give you alternatives if it's not safe. Uh, waste, reducing, treating and safely disposing of healthcare waste. Healthcare uh, Without Harm was uh, leaders in uh, reducing and, and eliminating incineration of many products that quite frankly didn't need to be incinerated. Uh, re uh, reducing um, a lot of air pollution uh, from, uh, from hospital operations. Energy, uh, implement energy efficiency and clean renewable energy generation. Uh, Gunderson Health in Wisconsin, La Crosse, Wisconsin, were leaders in looking at biofuels and uh, renewable energy uh, for their facilities. Uh, water, reducing hospital water consumption and supplying potable water. Kaiser Permanente has a goal um, for, I believe it's 2025, uh, and very specifically looking at reducing water consumption in the hospital and its operations. Transportation, improving transportation strategies for patients and staff, whether it's electric vehicles or whether it's looking at uh, carpooling or other options uh, to transport, publicly transport people um, to and from work and to and from appointments. Uh, food, we'll hear from John um, shortly about um, some great ideas around food, whether it's purchasing and serving sustainably grown food, um, healthy food, plant-based foods. Um, how do we how do we do that in our healthcare organization, which can help lead us to uh, sustainability and um, uh, greener operations? Pharmaceuticals safely manage and dispose of pharmaceuticals. Um, Gunderson Health again has uh, a program. Um, 
a drop-off program for patients and families and community members uh, where there are drop-off boxes. Um, they're working in tandem with the public health department uh, to um, make sure those are safely disposed of. Uh, buildings, supporting green and healthy hospital design and construction. There are many, many hospitals um, that are, University of Maryland is one of them. There are hundreds, literally, that are redesigning their hospitals to use, for example, more natural light and less artificial light, um, both for the health of the employees and the patients, uh, because we know that natural sunlight helps heal, but also to reduce energy costs. And finally, purchasing by safer and more sustainable products and materials. Uh, there are many um, groups that are offering um, uh, IV materials, for example, that don't have DE, uh, DEHP, which is a plasticizer, uh, which is toxic and carcinogenic, um, as one example of what's happening um, in healthcare today. So Pope Francis really um, talks uh, very specifically that we are part of nature. Um, and um, the next uh, part of this, this talk will really focus in on Laudato Si, some of the um, components uh, that will hopefully inspire, guide, and inform us as we look to these healthcare investments that can make uh, our operations more sustainable. Some of these include integral ecology, justice, equity, protection of the vulnerable. Um, and um, if you don't know what um, integral ecology is, it's really, it's a key concept in chapter four of Laudato Si. And really it's all about um, us being connected. Everything is closely related. All of us are connected. And that's why I have the web as one of the, the photographs on the slide. Um, we cannot live in a silo. We don't live in a silo and anything we touch will impact the rest of, of uh, nature. And so how do we do the best we can in healing people and keeping nature um, healthy? Um, we should consider the ecological impact of operational and healthcare decisions um, using Laudato Si as our framework and our compass. Um, we, uh, Pope Francis talks about seeking comprehensive solutions which consider interactions within natural systems themselves and social systems. And I'm gonna give you a few examples in a minute. Um, uh, I do wanna just mention uh, very specifically something from Laudato Si. Um, he talks about, we need only recall how ecosystems interact in dispersing carbon dioxide, purifying water, controlling illnesses and epidemics, forming soil, breaking down waste, and in many other ways which we overlook or simply do not know about. And so he provides us really specific ideas and examples of what's going wrong and how we need to address these issues. Catholic Health Association has been way ahead of the curve uh, when talking about environmental health. And uh, there's, a, there's a publication um, from 2013 called Healing Communities and the Environment and Opportunities for Community Benefit Programs. Now, if you work in a healthcare system, you know community benefits is a requirement of the Affordable Care Act. And there have been a number of um, articles written um, about some of the work that hospitals have done specifically related to healing the environment. Um, and so some of these include affordable lead housing, uh, promoting community pharmaceutical uh, collection programs, one I just mentioned with Gunderson Health, addressing housing-based asthma triggers, protecting and creating nature spaces in urban areas, and establishing community gardens. Trevor, just put it up there. Thank you, Trevor. So I, um, I'm just gonna give a couple examples in deference to time. Uh, but uh, one of these uh, um, projects, uh, Bon Secours of 
uh, Baltimore, uh, Maryland uh, health system uh, created uh, uh, an affordable housing to improve health. And uh, they helped develop over 650 units of affordable housing and is planning to develop a total of 1,200 homes. Uh, funding for the purchase of the initial 31 vacant properties came from a $600,000 intra-company loan from Bon Secure Health Systems headquarters. To maximize its impact, it created Unity Properties, establishing a dedicated organization to perform the initial acquisition and development. Uh, one other um, uh, project is uh, the investing in neighborhood and housing revitalization to improve health. This was launched by Nationwide Children's, uh, which really um, took a look at uh, communities of color and looked at renovating and building new affordable healthy housing. Um, it has created over 100 affordable healthy homes since 2008 and spurred creation of the Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families nonprofit. And then the final one is Build Health Initiative. Uh, this supports healthcare systems and community groups uh, through funding to address housing-based asthma triggers. Um, and again, these projects, as you're thinking about them, uh, really um, take what the Pope uh, said, which is looking at natural systems and social system, systems and creating solutions so that um, we can help those in most need. So finally, I'd like just like to leave you with this quote, uh, again, from Health Progress. It's um, strategies for solutions demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. And keeping in mind that we can solve the problems we've created, healthcare must be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was uh, a great presentation. And, and just one takeaway uh, for me, I had many, but the one that stood out to me is that every department in a healthcare organization can do something to help the environment. It's not just the responsibility of um, environmental services or the people who run the building operations, every from clinicians to food services to community benefit. Um, so thank you. And I hopefully we'll get into that more in the Q&A. But thank you so much. And now I'm going and I just want to reiterate, if you have questions for Laura, please put them in the Q&A and we'll take um, questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Uh, so continue to put your questions in, but I'd love to turn it over now uh, to John Stoddard, who again is the Associate Director of Climate and Food Strategy for Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Food and Healthcare Program. And he's going to share some really interesting uh, uh, data and programs with you. So take it away, John. Thanks, Indu, and thanks, Laura. Pleasure to be here, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm calling in from Boston, Massachusetts, where it is finally nice out. So I'm grateful for that. Um, so today we're going to talk about the connection between climate change and our food system and uh, provide you with some um, real specific solutions that you can join and be a part of. So next slide, please. So a little bit about healthcare without harm before we get into the subject. Um, so we've been, we were founded about 25 years ago based on the belief that as the only sector with healing as its mission, healthcare has an opportunity to use its ethical, economic, and political influence to create ecologically sustainable, equitable, and healthy communities. So our mission is to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces its environmental footprint becomes a community anchor for sustainability and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. We conduct research, model strategic interventions and provide guidance and resources to spread and accelerate best practices in the field. We have programs focused on climate and health, safer chemicals, healthy food and others. Next slide. So our food program is called Healthy Food and Healthcare. It was launched in uh, 2005. That's the program that I um, work for. 
Uh, and the program works to harness the expertise, purchasing power, and investments of the healthcare sector to advance the development of a sustainable food system. We believe that hospitals are inf influential institutions in their communities with the power to affect social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. You'll see here a snapshot of the of the of our food work. Um, and our, the food work that our network's doing and reporting to us through the Practice Green Health Awards. And importantly, we use an environmental nutrition framework. And that holds that healthy food cannot be defined by nutritional quality alone. It is the end result of a food system that conserves and renews natural resources, advances social justice and animal welfare, builds community wealth, and fulfills the food and nutrition needs of all eaters now and into the future. Next slide. So scientific consensus shows that climate change is already damaging human health and healthcare delivery and will have a greater impact in the future. Healthcare is at the front lines of climate change, bearing the cost of increased diseases and more frequent extreme weather events. The healthcare sector's greenhouse gas emissions make up make up about 8.5 percent of the u.s total if it were its own country healthcare would rank 13th in the world for greenhouse gas emissions more than the uk hospitals and health systems recognize that climate change is the greatest threat to public health of our time and are addressing scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions which you can see little definition there um, on the graph on the slide they're building energy efficient builder buildings, capturing waste and acetic gases, and seeking alternatives to fossil fuels and energy use. However, the greatest source of a healthcare facility's greenhouse gas, emission, gas emissions are in scope three, you can see there, and the procurement of animal proteins and food waste fall in scope three. Food waste and, and uh, meat procurement happen to be the most one of the most accessible scope three um, emission sources to address. As you can see, the other um, sources can be much more complicated in dealing with your supply chain. So next slide, please. So the climate significance of a hospital's food choices parallels the food's effect globally. There are varying estimates, but food production generates about 23 to 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions, more than the transport sector. And food waste is responsible for about eight to 10 of global greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Two recent studies underscore the importance of addressing emissions from food production and food loss and waste. A 2020 article in Science asserts that even if every other sector of the economy met its climate targets, we would cross catastrophic climate thresholds if we do not address the food system. A study released just last month in Nature Climate Change, this is on the, the from the graphic on the right, found that food-related emissions alone could take us over the 1.5 degree threshold. And the chart shows the progress we can make in reducing warming by employing mitigations, mitigation measures, including food waste and diet. So you can see in green are, are the gains we could make through diet, and, uh, and the more red line up at the top, or there's two red lines that cover food waste um, up, up at the top of the graph. And I wanted to read a, a quote from the, the recent study. Previous, and so quote, previous studies have found that there may be synergies between actions associated with improving health and those associated with reducing greenhouse gas emissions intent intensity. And a health-driven mission may be more likely to be adopted on a global scale than changes in dietary behavior in response to environmental concerns. So basically saying leaning on sort of the, the, the health value um, could be more effective. And I'm going to continue reading this quote. Dietary recommendations were provided by Harvard Medical School, which specify, which specifically prescribed the sparing consumption of red meat and the limited consumption of fish, poultry, and eggs. We found that if these dietary changes were implemented globally, warming due to food consumption could be increased by 0.19 degrees Celsius at the end of the century. 
Okay, next slide. So from food production, this is a great graph from world from our world and data. You can see this the, the breakdown of where emissions are coming from in our in our uh, food system. A lot of times, I think many folks are familiar with the concept of food miles, and um, but you can see transport only makes up about six percent, and really it's production um, that makes up the most um, the greatest percentage of emissions. You can see also that livestock um, accounts for over half of the emissions. Next slide. So here's another uh, a snapshot of, of livestock's impact from the World Resources Institute. You can see animal proteins on the right side of the graph. They consume significantly more land and water than plant proteins on the left and generate significantly more greenhouse gas emissions. L uh, livestock amounts to about 14.5% of all global emissions. Additionally, the production of animal proteins consumes 83% of the available agricultural land and generates only 18% of the total calories consumed by humans and only 37% of the protein consumed. Intensive land production systems also impact health through independence on medically important antibiotics at subtherapeutic doses, contributing to the rise of antibiotic resistance. So this resource use has food insecurity implications in addition to climate. As incomes increase in lower income countries, meat consumption will increase and the earth does not have the capacity to support 10 billion people eating meat at the same rate that Western countries do. So it's un incumbent upon countries with high rates of meat eating like the US to reduce their use of animal proteins in order to ensure that we all can feed a growing population without pushing the earth to unsustainable thresholds. Next slide, please. So now I wanna focus in a bit on food waste. Over one third of food produced, both edible and inedible is sent to landf landfills, contributing to climate change. The decomposition of food and other organic materials in an oxygen poor landfill creates methane, a powerful greenhouse gas that is 72 more time, times more potent than carbon dioxide and is a major contributor to the climate crisis. And less than 3% of wasted food is recovered. So that would be fed to people or animals or compost or composted. And the remainder is sent to landfills. Next slide. This graphic um, is from the 2021 EPA report from Farm to Kitchen, the environmental impacts of US food waste. And it underscores that wasted food embodies wasted resources. So the greenhouse, so this it represents the greenhouse gas emissions generated to produce the food, the water and energy it took to produce the food, enough fertilizer to, to grow all the plant foods for human consumption in a year, and 140 million acres of agricultural land, an area the size of California and New York combined. And what's important to note here is that the climate impact of food waste is precisely wasted resources. So the decomposition of uh, food waste and landfills is really about 30% of its climate impact. The other 70% is are the are, are the wasted resources um, that happen when food is is wasted. So ne next slide, please. Okay, so this one, um, this is kind of hot off the presses. Some I added this slide at kind of the last minute. Um, someone sent it to me, um, but this this shows that the. It, it, there, there was a life cycle of assessment of food waste done, and it found that food waste could make could could make up half of the emissions from the food system, much more than people previously thought. And again, majority of the emissions are embedded in production. They say about sixty seven percent, and end stage emissions like landfills make up the remainder. Okay, next slide, please. So this is um where we start talking about solutions. And if you wouldn't mind, Christy, just advancing like four times. So we have got, um, we've got 
two programs and you can stop I keep one more <laughs> thanks uh so we've got two programs uh to address what we were just speaking about um but I want to note that healthcare is 18% of the US economy employs 22 million workers or about 14% of of US workers so just giving you a, an idea that the sector can have significant impact not only from its purchases and practices but also by modeling climate friendly practices to those that it serves and so our two programs plant forward future and food waste solutions they each have two distinct goals for healthcare to aim from plant forward future reducing greenhouse gas emissions from food purchasing by 25% by 2030 and food waste solutions reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from food waste by 2030. And I'll explain a bit more on those goals, but I want to start off with plant forward future. If you'd go to the next slide, please. And you can go to the next slide. I just wanted to make sure everyone's got to see that fun animation. Um, so let's start off first with the definition of plant forward. Plant Forward celebrates the delicious variety of foods from plants and de-emphasizes, de but not but does not completely eliminate animal proteins. So we at Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health have always taken, have always advised healthcare to take a less meat, better meat approach, encouraging hospitals to serve meals in which meat is not central to a dish or to an overall meal program. When, it, when animal proteins are used, prioritize production practices that are better for human health and the environment, as identified by our healthy food purchasing standards, which I'll uh, touch upon briefly at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So what is Plant Forward Future, our program? Um, it's a curated set of resources from Practice Green Health and Healthcare Without Harm and our partners like uh, humane society, et cetera. You'll find resources from various folks um, that the resources help healthcare facilities set a plant forward goal, menu and market plant forward dishes, and track progress. Next slide, please. So we have the program has over 25 resources to help you implement a plant forward program, market plant forward dishes so they sell, and track your progress. It uses positive mes messaging that helps hospitals market plant forward strategically so that the effort is successful. For example, our marketing resources and guidance focus on the delicious food diners can expect, what is in a dish, what is not, what is not in a dish. So we stay away from words like vegan or meat-free. Plant Forward Future also outlines reasons for shifting to Shifting to a plant forward menu, including the business case, which is very important when retail operations and healthcare are just like business little restaurants. Um, and so the, these making the case resources can help you make the case to your colleagues. Next slide. And there are three main sub programs under healthcare without harm. The first we have plant powered 30 which is an employee engagement activity which hospitals can use to challenge their employees to eat plant forward for a full month. We have our healthcare culinary contest which celebrates hospital chefs that are creating successful plant forward dishes. And we have the cool food pledge which is a pro the primary program we drive healthcare to for implementing plant forward menus. Next slide. So hospitals wanting to reduce their use of animal proteins by implementing plant forward menus can utilize our plant forward resources. This is sort of two choices here. Um, you can use those on your own and report through your progress through the Practice Green Health Awards pro platform, or you can join Cool Food for enhanced support. And I'm gonna go over Cool Food now, the next slide. So Cool Food, it's an international cross-sector effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from food purchasing. The World Resources Institute is the secretariat and Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health provide the technical assistance to the healthcare sector. Next slide. These are some of the organizations in Cool Food. Hospitals you can see in the lower right quadrant. And at 79 hospitals, uh, Healthcare makes up about 45% of Cool Food membership. 
The entire cool food cohort represents nearly 3.5 billion meals per year, and the healthcare sector is about 70 million meals. And Brian from Peace Health, I noticed that you're on and your logo is not on this slide. So I will update this slide with Peace Health. Um, so thanks for being here and sorry your logo is not on there. Um, so let's see, next slide, please. Cool food. Um, so cool food is based on projections from the Science-Based Targets Initiative which looked at all sectors of the economy and set target targets for emissions reductions in order to, to prevent warming above catastrophic thresholds and to achieve the goals set out in the Paris Climate Agreement. So the food and agriculture sector, according to Science-Based Targets Initiative, must reduce emissions by 67% by 2050. And cool food puts us on a pathway to get ha halfway there. So you can see the, the goal for cool food is reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030, which is a goal I mentioned um, at the beginning of our solutions um, section here. So uh, next slide, please. So we do have a number of um, uh, members of the Catholic Health Association in cool food, but I wanted to spotlight one here. So I mentioned uh, Peace Health. Uh, we also have some folks, um, some hospitals in the Providence system, um, but Virginia Mason, so they're located in Seattle, Washington. They're a 336-bed teaching hospital. They joined Cool Food in 2019, and they serve over 1.2 million meals per year. Next slide, please. So this is a, a good example. So if you join Cool Food, you provide us with data annually, and what you get back is a snapshot of your purchases, as well as a snapshot of your emissions and where they're coming from. And you can see progress over time. Virginia Mason, as I mentioned, joined in 2019. They have since gone through a number of transitions, so unfortunately haven't submitted data um, since 2020. But most hospitals have submit data every year, but I, I just wanted to show you, they did manage to have a great impact. So their food purchases have gone up um, in 2020, which was unusual for COVID. Um, but next slide, please. Their emission, their emissions went down and you can see um, on the previous slide, I should have pointed out, but they made a number of changes to their, to their sort of pantry in, in the sense that they reduced beef, they reduced uh, other animal products and increased um, things like legumes and plant-based milks. And so you can see that's how um, they managed to, to get that dramatic reduction of um, 46%. Next slide, please. So after four years in cool food, um, Hospitals, hosp hospitals have reduced their per plate emissions as a whole, the whole co cohort, um, by 13%, which is amazing progress. Some individual facilities have already reached or exceeded the goal, like you saw with Virginia Mason, but I will, I'm happy to report that 98% of all hospitals, that's 79 hospitals and cool food, have made redu emissions reductions. So now I'm going to uh, move to food waste, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I mentioned we're, our food waste um, resources are called food waste solutions. You can go to the next slide. So similar to Plant Forward Future, our food waste solutions toolkit campaign contains a page on making the case. case. Uh, and so with food waste, food insecurity is a very powerful mo motivator as one in six people in the US experience food insecurity. Next slide, please. Healthcare produces a significant amount of food waste, which contributes to the, their environmental impact, costs money, and is a missed opportunity for addressing food insecurity in your community. With over 6,000 healthcare institutions in the US, it's estimated the sector generates about 23 1,500 tons of food waste annually. Redu reducing food waste can obviously impact your climate footprint. Also, experts predict that reducing 
food losses by just 15% would provide enough food for more than 25 million people living in the United States every year. This is a really great example of co-benefits. Okay, next slide, please. So our toolkit, which was just released late last year, um, follows the EPA's food waste recovery hierarchy, which you can see on the right of the slide. It prioritizes source reduction and donation. So if you remember from when we were talking about impact with the with the emissions being sort of um, embedded in food, where, where it wasn't so much their decomposition, while well, that contributes decomposition and landfills, it's all the, the wasted resources from food. So that's another reason why really source reduction is your most powerful measure against um, food waste. So the toolkit um, guides hospitals through the steps of performing a waste audit and identifying strategies to take action. Strategies include root to stem cooking, working with donation partners in your communities, and recycling items that are not captured through source reduction and donation. Importantly, we call upon healthcare to join the US, EPA, the FDA, the United Nations, and many others in mobilizing to reduce food loss and waste by 50% by 2030. So that's our second goal. Next slide, please. And I am gonna, I think I'm gonna be right on time, Indu. Um, so here's a snapshot of, a, of an impact that a healthcare facility can make from January 20. 20 to February 2021, healthcare engaged Sutter Health's 10 hospital facilities in a food waste prevention and edible food donation pilot program. Over the length of the pilot, 65,000 pounds of food were donated to 40 nonprofit partners with less than five miles, all less within less than five miles of the facility, which was a critical win. So donating food not only addresses food insecurity, but it's also an opportunity to engage with those that connect regu regularly with those most in need in our communities. Next slide, please. So I'm actually gonna be wrapping up here. I just wanted to mention um, our, uh, our procurement. Which I, uh, which I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation. We really didn't have time for that today, but supporting sustainable, agroecological, regenerative agriculture practices that reduce synthetic inputs and actually build soil health is another crucial climate strategy. To give you an idea, anchors in, anchor institutions in the US like schools, hospitals, university, and jails spend $130 billion annually on food. So that gives you an idea of, the, of their power of procurement. Um, and we just released new food purchasing standards that I hope you will check out on our, on our website. Visit our Practice Green Health food page um, to learn more about those standards. And finally, uh, next slide. Wanted to invite you, well, first to become a member of Practice Green Health. Um, cool Food, the Cool Food Pledge is free to Practice Green Health members. You also get access to all sorts of support around um, in improving operations for health and climate. Um, as I mentioned, we have many different programs that we can help hospitals, including food, um, improve their impact. Um, and please align with hospitals and other organizations across the globe. Um, consider joining us in these goals of a 25% reduction by 2030 from food purchasing. Join Cool Food for, um, for enhanced support to meet those goals. Also consider um, the food loss and waste goal of reducing by 50% by 2030. We are working with Refed currently, which is a leading food waste organization to develop a custom calculator for healthcare that considers patient meals, um, et cetera, because healthcare is unique. So we will be coming out soon with a calculator that can help you measure your progress towards that goal. Um, I wanted to also mention if you're in the Northwest or Chicago area, we have discrete projects in both of those areas around food and climate. So please contact me if you're in that area and would like to learn more. Next slide, please. 
And I also want to invite you to our Clean Med Conference, which is next month. It's a great conference, basically the only conference for healthcare sustainability. Um, and uh, we'll, we're in Pittsburgh this year. We have a number of food-related um, sessions, as well as many other topics. So ch check out the agenda on our website. Next slide. When these slides come out, you'll have plenty of links to read more. And final slide, please. My contact info is there. Feel free to get in touch at any time. Thank you. Thank you, John. That um, presentation was very sobering. Um, I, I had told John earlier when we were kind of doing our prep that I had kind of had an inkling about the impact of food on the environment and, and the data is just amazing. And actually, I don't know if folks have been reading, uh, the Biden administration has started to put um, guidance around uh, water allocation for, uh, for states around the Colorado River. I mean, it's, it's, I think you said, John, it's not something that's happening in the future. <laughs> it's happening now. And, you know, agriculture is one of the main um, uh, um, industries that pull from the Colorado River. So um, I, I think there's just so much to, to uh, think about from your presentation. So I want to thank you and also to tell folks that if you have a question, um, to please put it in the Q&A. Um, we have a, a, you know about five or so minutes to take some questions. And also, John, you had mentioned that we have a number of folks on the uh, program, I, Brian Nelson, um, and from Providence. So if somebody wants to share about <laughs> how the Cool uh, Food Pledge um, has been rolled out in your organization, I think folks on the uh, call would love to hear that. If you just want to put in the chat, um, we can take you off mute and put you on camera and you can share some of um, your experiences. But um, I don't see any questions right now. So I will ask um, Laura first, you know, one issues around the environment can be a bit controversial, not controversial, but politically fraught. Mm -hmm. And I think this connection between the environment and health can be a way to um, kind of get past that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point, Andu. Um, I have found over the years, um, I live in the DC area and spend uh, a fair amount of time speaking to policymakers and others about the connection, particularly as we look at climate change and health, um, how environment impacts health. And um, it, uh, it can be politically charged until you start talking about the health impacts, um, particularly as you talk about children or grandchildren and how um, these, uh, these exposures, whether it's heat, whether it's uh, water insecurity, whether it's uh, toxic chemicals, um, we know with um, the large amount of research coming out on a number of exposures that many of these things, um, first of all, they are not in isolation, right? So you could be living through climate change and live near uh, um, an industry that spews out air pollution. And so you're getting um, a combination and a synergistic effect from, from these exposures. And we know with certainty um, that many of these exposures can lead to health effects such as respiratory conditions. Um, any of you living in the DC metro area know that the allergy season is in full bloom. And uh, when we compound uh, the warming trends, we're seeing uh, plants blooming earlier, blooming longer, um, larger pollen, uh, so that we're seeing more and more people, for example, with, uh, with allergies that never experienced them before. Um, we're looking at um, PFAS in the water, uh, perfluoroalkyl substances that can lead to a number of cancers. And when we start really talking about the science and what we know so far, um, many people will sit straight up and start thinking about how this, particularly policymakers, might impact their kids or their grandkids or their families. And so um, the environment, um, unfortunately, has become politicized, uh, but uh, we are seeing 
uh, with this current administration, um, a recognition and um, an acknowledgement and honoring of uh, our resources that they are not unlimited and that we need to take care of what we've got. Uh, and um, I would go back to Laudato Si and the prayer that we really need to think about how our actions um, impact uh, the world, but they will impact our health. There's no doubt about it. Thank you, Laura. That's and and you know you talked about policymakers, but even within our organization, there might be people with different views. So uh, I think you know, John, you had mentioned use not using the term vegan or vegetarian. You have to really think about how you present this work sometimes. And my husband is one of those. I cannot ever say that something is vegan. <laughs> so, um, we have a couple questions and comments. First, um, John, I don't know if you could put in the chat. Someone asked if there's a cost to to cool food, but I see Lois has her hand up and she has some questions around if you're participating in other pledges such as Race to Zero and the HHS Climate Pledge, which require reporting. And we know that can take time and resources is what additional reporting is required for the cool food pledge. And Indu, while we're waiting on that, um, I, Brian Nelson also prompted me to share with everyone on the call today that um, I'm with Ascension and we have um, embarked on a grand adventure to install food waste digesters in our hospitals. And so we have food waste digesters installed in 69 of our hospitals to date. Wow. And so we're learning how to feed them and love them and baby them and um, reduce our food waste. That's fabulous. And John, did you want to comment? Um, Sorry, you know what? I was trying to respond to the meeting, <laughs> the message in the chat. Oh, that's but, fine. <laughs> but what was the what was the question? Oh, just about the cost to join the food uh, oh, cool sure. food pledge, and then um, kind of you know, there's if you're part of different pledges, you know, what additional reporting is required for the cool food pledge if you're already reporting race to zero and HHS. Yeah, no problem. And I th I think I saw Brian was going to chime in, but I'll just say uh, cool food. So we arrange with, with World Resources Institute, who's the Secretariat of Cool Food, for all practice green health members for it to be available at no charge. There's some discounted rates. like So for example, uh, like IKEA, larger, well-resourced organizations will pay $5,000 a year to be in cool food. For healthcare, we have um, severe... Uh, very discount, very discounted rates uh, based on your FTEs. And uh, again, it's no cost if you're a practice green health member, but just email me and I can, we can talk about it and, and see like what's right for you. And then as far as data requirements, we collect uh, data on animal and plant proteins annually. So that's what's required. I'm happy to send around uh, actually, I can send to CHA the, the data collection sheet, and they can send that to everyone if people want to um, check it out. But Lois, it would be a nice compliment to the commitments you've already made, um, you know, because you'd be addressing scope three through food. Great. Um, well, I think uh, we we're coming up to the end of our time. And I, there were a few, and I want to thank you again, Laura and John. I think we could actually do a part two to this. There's so much information to share. Um, but I do want to uh, reiterate uh, John's mention about Clean Med. CHA will be having a lunch for our members there. So hopefully we can hear from Brian Nelson there about their work on um, Cool Food Pledge, because um, uh, I think the more we can share about how this work is doable, I, I think that uh, just moves us all forward. So just really quick, wanted to share some uh, resources. Uh, Laura had mentioned uh, some health progress articles. Uh, the fall 2021 uh, edition of health progress was just focused on healthcare and the environment. So lots of great examples from Ascension, Common Spirit, Providence about uh, work healthcare is doing um, to address environmental concerns. And then uh, the article that Laura mentioned about uh, community benefit and the environment. Um, and then we have done some, uh, a series of webinars that are really action oriented. Cause I think, you know, you hear about the problems and they're so dire and you just feel like, what can I do? We, uh, we've done a lot of webinars uh, recently that uh, provide you with some really 
uh, concrete action you can take, just like what um, Laura and John presented today. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, these are some Catholic resources. Um, we are a ministry of the church. It's important that our actions are, you know, informed by our faith and, and uh, Catholic social teaching. So these are a few. I just want to point out the Catholic Climate Covenants Earth Day resource. This is a uh, just out of the box, a one hour program you could do with your department, with your care creation team. It focuses on, focuses on sustainability. It's wonderful. And sign up for Earth Beat <laughs> through the National Catholic Reporter. You will stay abreast of everything related uh, to uh, Catholic uh, work around addressing environmental harm. And then the final slide, uh, if we could go to the next one, is just again, healthcare without harm is really the gold standard. I think <laughs> there, you know, the technical assistance is um, unbelievable, and clean med is just uh, talk about being with your people. It's just inspirational, full of information. I highly recommend it. And I also want to mention something that Lois mentioned. Um, the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, which was a, a new uh, office within the Health and Human Services uh, Division. And if I would highly recommend signing up for their updates. They've got great resources from the federal government to help um, with healthcare decarbonization. So with that, I, we're just a minute over. I'm going to do some uh, quick housekeeping. Please join us virtually for our um, annual assembly. Uh, you can see here QR code and the uh, link to go to find out more and to register. And also, I think there's one more slide here. Uh, thank you uh, for being with us. This is such an important issue as healthcare providers. You know, we have to be responsible for how we impact the environment. And we also have to be prepared to treat people who, who are already being impacted by the uh, by climate change and environmental um, pollution. And also um, as Catholic uh, uh, ministries, we have a special calling to care for creation. So thank you for being part of this webinar. I think Trevor has put a link in the chat box to please complete the survey and we'll be sending out a recording, the PowerPoint and all the links that have been shared. Um, but if you have any follow up questions that you thought of after we've finished, please email me. And I think we've shared Laura's and John's email addresses. So please, um, these are great experts. Uh, we're so fortunate to have them with us. Uh, please feel free to contact them as well. So thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the weather. <laughs> Take your allergy pills. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.